It is now time for question period. The member from York Simcoe. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, you have said that the mandatory Ontario pension plan will be good for the province, yet your government has not released any evidence to support these claims. In fact, the only information you have released is an internal document warning your minister that the pension plan will cost Ontario 54,000 jobs a year. Oh, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce has even said your government, at a minimum, must conduct and publicly release an analysis of the impact of the new pension plan. So, Premier, will you include a cost-benefit analysis of the ORPP in the 2015 budget? Will you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. And I know the uh, associate minister is uh, going to want to speak to uh, to this very important issue. As the member knows, we uh, we made this commitment as uh, a part of our budget and as a part of our platform, Mr. Speaker. It's a fundamental part of our plan for uh, the economy because we know that there are many, many people. In, in Ontario who are not able to save enough, Mr. Speaker, who are worried about retirement security, and we believe that it is important that government take action to make sure that they have the ability to retire in security after a life of, uh, of work, Mr. Speaker. I'm surprised, actually, that anyone in this House would not think that it's a good idea to, for the people of Ontario to have retirement security, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. Premier, you may not have evidence, but I do. CFIB has said over half its members will have to lay off workers. Lay off workers. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce has said 44 per cent of its members will have to reduce staff. We all Order, please. Um, on both sides. On both sides. I'm having difficulty hearing the question being put. So please, finish please. I don't need extra comments. We all know it's impossible to save for retirement if you have no job. Yep. So Premier, will you commit to help save jobs in Ontario by walking away from the ORPP? Walk away. Speaker, it's <laughs> It's, it's very interesting because um, people who have studied this issue and uh, who understand the uh, understand the way um, people are uh, able to uh, prepare for their retirement, Mr. Speaker. Um, Pretty much, there's there's a lot of agreement among those experts that there are not enough people in this province and in this country, quite frankly, saving for retirement. Right. And you know, organizations like CARP, Mr. Speaker, so the organization uh, of seniors across the country, uh, they who have no they have no stake in this. Member from Renfrew, the order. Where such a, a pension plan would benefit them. They are one of the strongest advocates Absolutely. for us doing this, Mr. Speaker. They believe that this is an important thing. So, Mr. Speaker, I uh, I believe that it is responsible for us to implement what we ran on, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We were very clear with the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what yeah, we're going yeah. to do. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, we will lose more than just jobs if the ORPP goes through. The Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association found that 78 per cent of workplaces will reduce or eliminate their existing pension plans if they are forced to take part in the ORPP. <laughs> Premier, over the next week, the PC caucus will be laying out five key commitments we need to see from your government in order to support your budget. This is the first. first one. Premier, will you commit in your 2015 budget to saving jobs and walking away from the ORPP? Walk away! <laughs> Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker. And um, you know, I, 
I do I appreciate raising the question in the House this morning because, Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are concerned about their retirement. In fact, just this week, a study from RBC was released, and 34 percent of people have contributed to their I don't anticipate shouting people down for the sake of not hearing them. From that RBC study, only 39% of respondents have put away money in 2014 for retirement through their RRSP. 30% said that they have not begun to save for their the retirement. Member from Oxford, the member Mr. from Dufferin Speaker, Caledon, Ontarians come to expect order. their government to take action to ensure a secure the retirement of the future. Come to order. In fact, 77% of Ontarians support an increase in pension benefits, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. And it is for this reason that our government has put forward the implementation of the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan so that when people retire, they can retire with dignity and Answer. have a secure yeah, savings yeah. floor yeah, yeah. in their retirement, Speaker. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Thank Bill, you very Bill, much, Mr. Bill. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Your government has caused a great deal of angst and hardship to our most vulnerable people by launching a messed up social assistance computer system that you were warned was not ready for implementation. Sam. SAMS continues to be an unmitigated disaster. Premier, earlier this month, I raised concerns with problems that SAMS are going to cause with the people's tax returns and related benefits, impacting as many as 700,000 adults and children dependent on ODSP and Ontario Works. We recently found out that you were forced to shred over a half a million T5 tax forms because of errors by your supposedly improved computer system. More Premier, are you yourself prepared to continue to assert that your government's $240 million and climbing social assistance system is experiencing a mere glitch? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Community and Social Services is going to uh, want to have more to say on this, but um, we've acknowledged that the implementation of the improved system has posed challenges. We understand that, Mr. Speaker. We also know we also know that uh, the SAMS, which is the uh, system that uh, that the member opposite is talking about, it, that that SAMS system is a key component of the transformation of Ontario's social assistance uh, program, Mr. Speaker. So it's very important that we have updated technology. There have been concerns and problems. The minister has visited offices. There is frontline support for people who are uh, who are going through this transition, Mr. Speaker. We have worked to make sure that uh, checks were put in people's hands so that they had the uh, they had the uh, benefit that they were uh, entitled to, Mr. Speaker. But we need to implement a, a system that is going to improve service, and that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. The member from Renfrew, come to order. You shouldn't flip the switch till it works. Back to the Premier Speaker. Premier, you suggested SANS would be a better, more efficient system. Recently, your government hired Price Waterhouse Coopers consultants to cover up your government's incompetence over SAMS implementation, and you issued not one but two rounds of so-called one-time and I might add unbudgeted funding to municipalities to mitigate the ongoing cost overruns with SAMS. Premier, can you assure that you will not download the cost of your SAMS mess on the back of local taxpayers and guarantee a full 100 percent short and long-term reimbursement to municipalities? Good question. <laughs> said this SAMS is being implemented this this uh, system is being implemented because it will improve service to uh, to people mr. speaker there's no question that there have been challenges as I would say there were challenges when the uh, the party opposite instituted changes mr. speaker in terms of uh, social assistance the, the implementation it has to be improved there's no question about that mr. speaker and we've hired a third party I'm pleased that we've hired a third party advisor to advise us to improve the uh, to improve the system Member from the speaker, and Carlton that's come to order. Be. we have to make these changes as parties before us have made changes, Mr. Speaker, we have to address the challenges as they come along, and it's it's important that we have expert advice on how to do that, and that's exactly what we've sought out, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Finally, the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order, so I can acknowledge his colleague. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to you. Well. Premier, I think you should talk to the frontline people and the recipients who aren't receiving these because it isn't an improved system. People on social assistance deserve stability, peace of mind, and the supports they rely on. They need to know that you'll put a stop to this waste and start putting money where it belongs, to helping our 700,000 vulnerable adults and children who depend on this support. As for my open letter, and I'm going to send you another copy of my page, Premier, I ask you again. How many more Sam stumbles can we expect in the future? How much will it cost the recipients and the taxpayers? Thank you. Thank you.
Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to update the House on the, a number of uh, the steps that we've been taking over the last few months to address the challenges in SAMS. Um, I have uh, spent the last few months visiting many offices, both the OW, uh, municipal partner offices, as well as ODSP, and I've certainly seen the frustration of the case workers on the front line, and this is why we've taken a number of steps. Our project team has instituted many uh, fixes in order to make the system function much more uh, smoothly. Uh, we're listening to frontline staff. I actually met with a, a number of QP and OPSU representatives yesterday. Uh, I understand the stress that they have been through, but at the end of the day, we have been extremely successful. We have now processed uh, four successful pay runs for both ODSP Sir. and OW monthly payments, payments to 570,000 families Thank each you. month. Thank you. No question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Can the Premier provide any guarantees that hydro rates, rates will not go up as a part of the Liberal plan to privatize Hydro One and local utilities? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, I thought when the, uh, the leader of the third party stood up, she was going to uh, say how important she thought it was to give people in this province who are struggling, who are the lowest income people, a break on hydro rates, Mr. Right. Speaker. I would have thought that that, have been the kind, that would have been the kind of uh, policy that the NDP would support. And in fact, it's the kind of policy that has been advocated for by poverty advocates. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. That's not, uh, that's not what this NDP is interested in. So, Mr. Speaker, to the, uh, to the question that the uh, leader of the third party has brought forward, um, I've been very clear that, uh, and we were very clear in the, in the election in our budget that we were going to have a review of assets, Mr. Speaker, and that that review of assets was about investing in transportation infrastructure and transit, Mr. Speaker. That is why we are doing it. At the same time, we recognize that price controls and uh, regulation Answer. need to be very much in place. And there needs to be continued ownership of those assets, Mr. Speaker. All of those pieces are Thank principles you. upon which we're making our decision. Supplementary. Well, I don't think I heard the assurance I was looking for, Speaker, because privatizing hydro means Ontarians are going to be paying higher hydro rates in this province. Mike Harris started down the hydro road, and the Liberals are doubling down on that road. If the Premier is so sure that privatizing Minister Ontario, of Economic our, Development sorry, come to order. is such a great deal, why won't she provide a simple guarantee to Ontarians that hydro rates will not go up under this privatization scheme? You. you know, Mr. Speaker, it's so interesting that the, uh, the member opposite is talking about uh, an issue that, of course, will, is decided by the Ontario Energy Board, and that regulation that I have said, Mr. Speaker, must stay in place, will stay in place. But on a day, on a day when the leader of the third party has the opportunity to talk about a policy that is going to lower electricity prices for the uh, lowest income people in this province, Mr. Speaker, that she's not interested in talking about that, that she's not interested in talking about a policy that actually is part of a poverty reduction strategy, Mr. Speaker, that actually supports people in the lowest income. That's a policy, Mr. Speaker, I would have thought the NDP would have been interested in. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Final supplement. Since 2002, hydro rates have gone up by more than 325 per cent, and all the Premier has for Ontarians is another, another privatization scheme. She'll sell off our hydro companies, put them in private hands, who just want to make more profit, Speaker, but still somehow it's supposed to be better for Ontarians. So I'm going to ask one more time. Are hydro bills going up under the Premier's new current privatization scheme? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, 
let me just talk about what the Ontario Electricity Support Program will do because I think it is very relevant. I've already addressed the issue. I've already addressed the issue of uh, price regulation, Mr. Speaker, and the protections that need to be in place. Whatever we do with uh, with assets, but the OESP is going to provide targeted support based on household income and size, Mr. Speaker. So it's a very strategic and surgical, I would say, uh, um, benefit, Mr. Speaker, that will help people who are most in need. So, as an example, a family of four with an income less than $28,000 would have a combined savings about $525 annually, Mr. Speaker. That's a significant reduction. And as I say, Mr. Speaker, on top of the other programs that we have in place to protect people who are struggling with, uh, with their overall right. costs, this new program will help the lowest income uh, Ontarians. That's something that I think the NDP should be cheering, Mr. Speaker. New question. Is there anybody that thinks the OEB is a price control agency is in la la land? I got to say. Uh, my next question is to the Premier. Speaker, how many schools have been targeted for closure since the Premier introduced the 2014 budget? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, let me uh, let me repeat what uh, both the Minister of Education and I have said many times, and that is that we continue to invest in the uh, the education of the children of this province, Mr. Speaker. The minister is going to be talking with uh, school boards today, uh, letting them know that the uh, education funding is remaining stable, Mr. Speaker, and in fact, in certain areas like maintenance, increasing funding, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is that school boards have to make decisions about uh, delivering programs that make the most sense in their communities. I believe in the school board's ability to do that on a local basis. Sometimes that means consolidating schools, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes that means renovating one school and moving kids into a new, uh, newly renovated school. Sometimes it does mean closing a school. Sometimes it means building a new school, Mr. Answer. Speaker. Those are decisions that local school boards need to make working with the ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, from 2011 to the 2014 election, at least 88 schools closed across this province. But the Premier won't say how many more schools are being targeted for closure uh, after the 2014 budget was first introduced. Today, school boards are learning how deep the Liberals will cut and how much pressure they're going to have to close even more schools. How many more schools does the Premier Order. think should be shut down in neighbourhoods across this province? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I would have thought that the uh, member opposite, the leader, would have been interested in the announcement that we made this, uh, this morning that, in fact, school board funding will be remaining stable this year. Yes, Speaker, last year, last year, the grants, the transfers to school boards, amounted to $22.5 billion. Yeah. This year, they'll amount to $22.5 billion. Despite the fact that enrollment is declining in Ontario, which means that there's actually a slight per pupil increase. But what I will say, Speaker, is we think that it's more important to fund children and make sure they get good programs and good supports and good Answer. resources rather than empty seats. And that's exactly what we're doing in this year's funding model. Thank you. Final well, Speaker, everybody in this chamber and everybody around Ontario knows very well that a freeze is actually a cut. So the minister can talk about it all she wants, but freezing education funding is actually cutting education funding. Order. Start the clock, please. And that means cuts to classroom support and layoffs for teachers and layoffs for education workers. The Toronto to transportation Board come to is order. already cutting 50 special education staff. Those are the staff that work with our most vulnerable children. And parents in the Toronto Catholic Board speaker are trying to protect their intensive special education support programs that their children need. Parents want the Premier to answer a simple question. Why are students being forced to pay for liberal mistakes? Minister. 
Yes, and, and actually, I think it's also important for the member opposite to know that if you look at the special education funding pot this year for uh, schools Order. across Ontario, you'll find that it actually goes up slightly, yes. even though the number of students is going down. Yeah. The, 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 the member knows that the enrollment in Ontario schools has been going down and down and down and down. So you really need to look at how much we're spending per pupil. And the spending per pupil has gone up 59% since 2003. The overall funding has gone up $8 billion since 2003. So I, I, Answer. So I absolutely disagree with the member opposite. We are funding the schools of Ontario absolutely adequately. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. A member from Whitby, Oshawa. Premier, you've promised to protect the social programs that Ontarians need and deserve, but evidence is clearly mounting that your failed economic policies are having serious consequences on Ontario's most vulnerable citizens. Your failed policies have forced the Toronto District School Board to cut 50 special education assistants and the children's Make sure the environment come to order. Ontario to eliminate 50 positions. But even more disturbing than that is the fact that there are over 21,000 children and adults with intellectual disabilities who are languishing on wait lists, waiting desperately for the supports and services that they desperately need. So I have a very simple question for the Premier, Mr. Speaker. Will she admit that her failed economic policies have consequences and are hurting Ontario's most vulnerable citizens? Well, Mr. Speaker, just you know, I, um, it's a it's a broad ranging question, but what I will say to the uh, the member opposite is that I, I absolutely reject the premise of the question. We've just had we've just had a conversation in this house about education funding, which is remaining stable in the face of declining enrollment, Mr. Speaker, and in terms of special education is actually going up. We we've had a conversation in the past days about health funding, Mr. Speaker. There are 24,000 more nurses in the system, Mr. Speaker, than there were in 2000. 5,000 more doctors, Mr. Speaker, and we're going through a transition. And in terms of in terms of disabilities, Mr. Speaker, in terms of funding for disabilities and developmental services, uh, Mr. Speaker, the fact is there is $810 million going into that sector, Mr. Speaker. It absolutely is. And I the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that the programs that have had long wait lists, the money that is going to the system is going in to reduce those wait lists for developmental services, Mr. Speaker. And I, and I, was, and I already talked about special ed in, uh, in education, Mr. Speaker. Special education funding in schools is going up across the province overall, even That's though sir. enrollment is declining, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I asked a really simple question, but it's one that the Premier clearly wishes to avoid. But the truth is obvious. In order to be socially compassionate, you first need to be fiscally responsible. Here, here, here. Mr. Speaker, good economic policy enables good social policy. Here, here. Premier, your failed economic policies are having serious consequences. Just ask, ask the students at the Toronto District School Board. Ask the young patients at the Children's Minister of Economic Center, Development. And ask the 21,000 children and adults and their families with intellectual disabilities why they're not getting the programs and services that they need and deserve. Premier, will you finally recognize that your failed economic policies are having serious consequences and seriously affecting the lives of Ontario's most vulnerable citizens? To the member opposite, I would say to the member opposite, she really can't have it both ways. Outside of this house, in her leadership, leadership campaign, Mr. If you haven't been able to tell by now, I'm asking for us to have a little bit of civility here. As soon as somebody stands up to answer, I hear shouting, and it's not appropriate. So I'll offer the member from the P and Carlton to come to order. 
I'm obviously not in the mood for joking. Finish, please. Her leadership campaign, she has promised that she will cut a billion dollars by way of a tax cut from the very services that she's talking about, Absolutely. Mr. Speaker. So the, so the right. hundreds of millions of dollars that we're putting into education, that we're putting into health care, and that we're putting into developmental services would be gone, Mr. Speaker, because she's going to find a billion dollars according to her platform, Mr. Speaker. So I would ask the member opposite to make some consistent statements about what her plan would be, because what she's saying now, Mr. Speaker, does not make sense. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. <clears throat> my, my question is to the Premier. Premier, both Pat Sabera, your Deputy Chief of Staff, let me repeat again, I think they did. Order. Both Pat Sabera, your Deputy Chief of Staff and Campaign Director, and Mr. Sabera, your Liberal Operative in Ottawa, had conver uh, Mr. Lougheed, I should say, had a discussion with Mr. Olivier about his. Clock, please. Stop the clock. I demand the same courtesy on both sides. Thank you. So again, I said, Pat Sabera, your Deputy Chief of Staff, and Mr. Lougheed, the local operator in, in, in Sudbury, had direct conversations with Mr. Olivier about standing down. My question to you is, were you aware that those conversations were going to take place? Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And I, 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 I take it that uh, the uh, the member uh, from Timmins James Bay has uh, taken on the responsibility of at least having one question about an issue that we've discussed uh, at several occasions in this House. Premier has been absolutely uh, clear, uh, uh, Speaker, that uh, this matter is being NDP dealt by by way of an uh, investigation, which is. Uh, done by independent the House leader, outside, the, outside this legislature, and we should respect that process. Uh, speaker, the the notion of procedural fairness and and, and natural justice in our in our system of democracy uh, requires that we let uh, arms length uh, 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 investigative bodies uh, undertake uh, their responsibilities, and we should not be using this legislature to to be quarterback uh, investigators. So I urge the member opposite to respect the process, uh, understand the notion of yes, innocence. A presumption of innocence and let the in, in authorities complete the investigation. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Well, back to the Premier. I would urge you to answer the question. This legislature has certain rights. Those rights were given to us by the Canadian Constitution and allows members to stand in this House to ask relevant questions having to do with issues that are important to Ontarians. Your Deputy Chief of Staff and your Liberal Operator in Ottawa, in, in Sudbury, continually talk to Mr. Olivier about not running and standing down. So I'm going to ask the question again. Were you aware that these conversations were going to take place, yes or no? Minister. Well, uh, Speaker, I, I uh, fully, uh, uh, we fully respect the, the right of the opposition to ask questions. I hope they, we hope that they ask questions on issues that are important to Ontarians, so, like how we are giving, uh, giving a break to uh, low-income Ontarians on, on their electricity break, how we're making sure they're investing in our education. Speaker, uh, this is an investigation that is going on outside this legislature. We have important issues to deal with as we build Ontario up. I ask the member opposite to let the authorities do their work. The chief electoral officer officer is very clear. He said that he has not many any he has not made any determination of innocence of guilt because that is up to the prosecutors and judges to decide. We should respect uh, his opinion. The member opposite himself had uh, said on occasion that the premier should not interfere in the investigation. He's absolutely right. This is exactly what she is doing. Uh, and while Answer. she's doing this, she will continue to focus on uh, making sure that we're building Ontario up. Thank, Thank you, you very much. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question this morning is for the minister responsible for seniors' affairs. Mr. Speaker, Ontario has a proud history of being one of the most culturally and socially diverse populations in the world. World. It's important to recognize that this remarkable diversity also extends to our significant and growing senior population. In fact, Mr. Speaker, more than 55 per cent of all Canadian immigrant uh, seniors live in the province of Ontario. As well, a larger portion of our 2 million seniors are female, and this difference increases greatly.
greatly in the oldest age groups, where over 70 per cent of persons aged 90 or older are female. In my own riding of Davenport, there is a sizable and very diverse older adult community, and my senior constituents represent many different cultural, ethnic, and social groups. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could you please provide us with details regarding the programs and services our government is investing in to support seniors from diverse communities? Thank you. The minister responsible for senior affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you for, uh, to the member from Davenport for, uh, for the question. Uh, speaker, we recognized uh, uh, this incredible diversity when we established first in 2010 the Ontario Action Plan for Seniors. And I have to say, Speaker, that the member is quite right that 50, 55 plus percent of Canada's seniors population lives in our province of Ontario. Nearly one third of those senior speakers report a mother tongue other than English and French, and 7 percent speaker, uh, especially new immigrants, don't speak any of our official languages. Uh, speaker, facing the reality of this diversity, our government long ago started to invest on a number of important uh, programs addressing this diversity. We produced, for example, the Seniors Guide to Program and Service for, for Seniors in 16 Languages. Answer. We deliver information fairs in northern and remote community to reach our Francophone Arab Aboriginal seniors. We Thank fund you. the Ingo Line in Turkey Land. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, I recently had the pleasure of hosting the minister in Davenport for an event which truly highlights our government's continued commitment to serving the needs of seniors in my community and celebrating their diversity. On this occasion, seniors from the Vietnamese Association of Toronto join us for an impressive Tai Chi demonstration. With funding provided by the seniors' community grants, seniors learned Tai Chi exercises and, in turn, became volunteers teaching other seniors their skills. Mr. Speaker, another great example for my riding of an organization that was financed is a, was a symposium for immigrant senior women through the grant program. This educational symposium brought together senior women in diverse backgrounds to participate in workshops and obtain essential resource information. Question. Mr. Speaker, it's clear these investments have been extremely well received in Ontario. In Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please provide Thank further you. information on how we're supporting these seniors. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member again for the question. Let me say that priorities of the Seniors Community Grant Program uh, includes a focus on Aboriginal communities and a project embracing, indeed, our cultural diversity. Speaker, back in 2010, when we introduced the, and passed the Retirement Home Act, we ensured that important provisions were put in place to protect, indeed, diversity. It is now a requirement by law that all 700 of them, Speaker, retirement homes must prominently display a Bill of Rights which entitled the residents to have their lifestyle and choices respected and to freely pursue their social, cultural, religious, spiritual and other interests. Speaker, we launched the groundbreaking multicultural funding away program for people with dementia, and we do that in 12 languages, Speaker. On top of that, Speaker, Answer. we have a very success successful and helpful guide which provides seniors with active living information, caregiving, transportation, and housing. Thank you. Your question the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister, on Monday you told this House that there will be more family physicians and specialists practicing in the province. Contrary to this, the Ontario Medical Association, the people who represent Ontario's doctors, released a statement saying that your government's imposed cuts will drive new physicians out of Ontario and hurt patient care. How can you stand in this House and say there will be increases when the opposite are true? Are you calling Ontario's doctors liars? Well, uh, being a member of the OMA, I would certainly, uh, myself, I would certainly uh, not do that. I hold the OMA and our physicians, the more than 30,000 physicians around this province, in extremely high regard. But what I will say to the member opposite that uh, this, the OMA negotiations were about one thing and one thing only. They were about physician remuneration. They're about the amount of dollars that physicians in this province earn. And historically, and certainly the, certainly the current situation is that doctors in this province, as they should be, are among the highest paid in this country, Mr. Speaker. They're also among, if not the highest talented in this country and in North America. But this is not about 
care to patients. This has nothing to do with access to health care for individual Ontarians. This agreement, and unfortunately, despite That's our it. umpire, retired Justice Warren Winkler, uh, asking the OMA to accept our offer. The OMA did Thank not. You. Unfortunately, we've had to move ahead without them. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, speaker, back to the minister. Minister, in the southwest Lynn, there's over 38,000 people without a family physician, and these imposed cuts on these doctors is not going to help that situation one bit, whatever. Minister, uh, you have failed to deny what a high-needs area is, and by doing so, these new uh, doctors will not be able to practice in a family health team throughout southwestern Ontario. You told this House, and I quote, doctors are entitled to practice wherever they want in this province. However, again, the OMA has said to your government that the government has limited new graduates from practicing in family health teams. Medical students are trained to work in team-based family practice models. Yep. Why won't your government work with the frontline health care workers to find solutions to protect Ontario's health care system? Why do you find this so difficult? Here, here. Well, in, in fact, many parts of southwestern Ontario will benefit from the changes that we're making because we are increasing, we are continuing our commitment to create new family health team positions and family health team uh, play, uh, uh, or, uh, entities in those parts of the province that require them. For example, in the northern part of this province, there are roughly 40 family health teams there currently. I'd like to see more of them. And in the small towns and rural parts of this province, where there are, I think, about 70 or 80 family health teams currently operating, I'd like to see more as well. So we're continuing to allocate positions to those parts of the province. We're going to be able to define exactly what parts of the province we're talking about within the next several weeks. Uh, but certainly, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've added 5,000 physicians to this province's uh, health care services in the past decade. We're continuing to Answer. add more. We're providing opportunity, and those family doctors can and will practice in whatever part of the province. They, they choose to. Thank you. The question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Thousands of persons with disabilities are proud to be part of the workforce, but they count on a $100 top-up each month to help pay for the cost of that work. Now, the same Premier who promised to protect social assistance is cutting this crucial funding. She promised one thing, and she's doing the exact opposite. And 34,000 ODSP recipients are at risk of suffering a huge cut this October. Speaker, I want to give the Premier a chance to fix this mistake. Will she abandon her plan to eliminate the work-related benefit, or will she steamroll ahead with the cuts to social assistance? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the work of uh, my ministry is to look after those most vulnerable in our society, both those on OW and ODSP. And uh, we really are looking very carefully at ways that we can assist this uh, population. Uh, we are looking at ways to improve employment opportunities for those with disabilities. And we've introduced a number of measures to encourage those who are able to, in fact, seek employment. And uh, as I think everyone in this House knows, we've uh, uh, put an earnings exemption in now so that the first $200 worth of employment income, uh, uh, those individuals do keep that. And over and above the $200 that they earn, 50% uh, is uh, kept uh, in, their, in their hands. Uh, so we are very conscious of uh, doing everything yes, we can uh, to encourage these individuals uh, to uh, be part of our society and take part uh, in every aspect. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the, to the Premier. I understand what those changes are supposed to do, but it's actually going to work in the negative if you don't do something to fix it. The Liberals are ignoring the real problems of some of our most vulnerable people. Cutting the work-related benefit means no bus tickets to get to work. It means cutting back on food. It means scrambling to get another shift or being forced out of the workforce altogether. There is nothing more cynical than a poverty reduction strategy based on cutting $100 per month from, a social, from the social assistance. Premier, what will it take, or Speaker, what will it take the Premier to stop these cuts to social assistance? Minister. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think, uh, as the member knows, uh, we are looking to streamline various employment uh, benefits uh, for those with disabilities, so that, in fact, we will be creating a far more flexible benefit, so that those individuals who do require some assistance in terms of obtaining additional training or other skills that they may need in order to enter the labour market will be able to do so. And in fact, we'll see increased amounts and increased funding uh, for those purposes. Um, the specific area of the work-related benefit has been put on hold as of this date, as the member mentioned, uh, and we continue to ensure that uh, as we move on social assistance reform that we look at all opportunities to protect and uh, encourage those vulnerable Ontarians uh, to take their full place uh, and be yeah, included yeah. in our society. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Good morning, speaker, speaker, and thank you. My question uh, through you to the Minister responsible for women's issues. Speaker, we recently began public hearings for the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment. Work. Committee work has been progressing very well in examining sexual violence and harassment in the workplace and beyond. It is an example of positive, nonpartisan collaboration that we can have if we work together as parties. Here, here. It's never okay the action plan to stop sexual violence and harassment helps to contextualize the work that the committee is doing. I know the purpose of the plan is to engage everyone in communities, classrooms, workplaces across Ontario in the conversation about how to stop sexual violence and harassment. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you say that we have begun to see an impact. Thank you, Minister Children and Services, responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Barrie for asking this very pertinent and timely question. Indeed, our approach is having an impact. Speaker, our government's ads that have been out there in the public domain have been viewed by more than 7 million people. On the Ontario government YouTube page alone, over 1 million views. And it's become a viral sensation around the world, with 2.5 million Facebook wow. views in Turkey, where local activists added Turkish subtitles, and it's been reviewed 1.7 million times in Brazil. Wow. Given the number of the people around the world have seen this ad speaker in English and French, and international translations we posted. We know it's resonating. Other nations where the ad has been widely seen on YouTube includes the United States, the Philippines, India, and France. By having this discussion as a society, we can do a much better job of increasing awareness and having an open discussion about Answer. sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My next question also is for the minister responsible for women's issues. It is wonderful that the campaign is beginning to resonate so much in just the first few weeks of its launch. It makes me very proud to be a member of this government to see such wide interest re receptivity to our ad, not just in Ontario, but in, in Canada, but internationally as well. It seems like a step in the right direction towards changing attitudes and creating more public awareness of this issue. I understand that as part of the work on the action plan, you are convening a multi multi-sector roundtable through the Ontario Women's Directorate on this issue. How will the roundtable help to improve the experiences of survivors that come forward uh, about abuse and make workplace and campuses safer and more responsive Question. to complaints about sexual violence and harassment? Through you, Speaker, to the Minister. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. So the Permanent Roundtable on Sexual Violence and Harassment is a forum of expert speaker that will advise government on our initiatives and all the issues and opportunities around sexual violence and harassment. And there are many diverse voices around that table speaker. We have representatives that have significant frontline support. Uh, who work with different communities. The roundtable includes experts on issues affecting specific populations as well, such as Aboriginal persons, Francophone, LGBT, newcomers, persons with disabilities, youth and older women, as well as boys and men. It also has experts who can speak to violence and harassment in the workplace at our colleges and universities, which is a big issue right now, Speaker. So I'm very pleased uh, that the Select Committee uh, is moving ahead, and the roundtable will uh, be kept informed of the work of the committee and coordinate the efforts. Thank, Thank you very you. much.
Question, the member from Paul and Norfolk. Speaker, to the uh, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, on March 23rd, you released a draft regulation for an 80% neonic ban on Ontario's corn and soybean acreage. This is exactly what you proposed before Christmas, and in spite of feedback, no change. Also on March 23rd, the USDA released its study concluding neonics are not driving BDS. The evidence for your ban is at best circumstantial and has not been proven in controlled scientific studies, certainly not from Health Canada's pest management agency where the true expertise lies. Your approach is derived from ideology. It's irresponsible. It's intimidating. Minister, why did you allow emotion to trump science? Here, here. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the question from the honourable gentleman from Holland and Norfolk. We do know that a healthy pollinator strategy is very important to the agricultural community in the province of Ontario. We do know, we do know that there's a number of contributing factors to bee health in the province of Ontario. Uh, we've gone through uh, two very severe winters in the province of Ontario. We do know that there's a mite, the Vermont mite, that uh, can uh, impact the health of beehives in the province of Ontario. We do know that appropriate management of beehives in the province of Ontario is, is very important. And we do know uh, that the use of sub pesticides is a contributing factor uh, to bee health in the province of Ontario. And indeed, working with my colleague, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, the province of Ontario, we listen. We listen, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we listen. Order. We had public Answer. consultations right across the province of Ontario. We had consultations through the EBR. We have taken all that information Thank into you. consideration, and we look forward to the future. Thank you. Supplementary, please. Well, Minister, uh, we do know the uh, crucial role of pollinators, and I, I have on my desk the Ontario Pollinator Health Blueprint. Yes. You would as well. It comes from a task force of certified crop advisors, ag retailers, the seed trade, farmers, beekeepers, recommendations for increased communication between farmers and beekeepers, work on bee nutrition and habitat, manageable and reasonable limits on insecticide use. You asked for feedback, as you said. You asked Cash Crop and the beekeeper community to meet you halfway. They have. And yet, despite all of this, you're adamant on your neonic ban. Minister, you propose regs, in my view, are anti agriculture. You are supposed to be the minister for agriculture, to represent farmers. You are at the table in cabinet. Why will you not speak up for farmers? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, since I've been a very culture this morning, <laughs> I won't. Uh, I won't. You, you, you don't start until I acknowledge. Sorry, I'm just so mm, yes, I know. <laughs> Minister of Agriculture. Well, Mr. Speaker, I heard the supplementary from my my good friend, the member from Holland and Norfolk. So let's look at the facts. Agriculture sector of the province of Ontario, $34 billion in GDP. Wow. Employs, Mr. Speaker, employs 760,000 Ontarians each and every day. Wow. Represents 23%. 23% of our manufacturing sector in Ontario is in the agri-food sector. You know, I spend my time on the back concessions in Ontario and at kitchen tables. I know, I know this government knows that the agri-food sector has a tremendous potential for growth, not the negativity shown by the official opposition. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. There are currently doctors practicing in Ontario, paid by OHIP, who believe that being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans is a form of mental illness. Instead of offering support to LGBTQ kids, these doctors tell them they are broken and need to be fixed. Instead of helping, they use abusive conversion therapies that try to turn these kids straight. I recently introduced a bill that would prevent Ontario's doctors from abusing LGBTQ kids with such so-called therapies. California and New Jersey have already passed similar laws. Premier, I ask on behalf of survivors, 
like Erica Muse, and the victims who did not survive, like Leela Alcorn, will you ban conversion therapy for LGBTQ children? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Good. You see that, please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to applaud the member opposite. I think this is an important, uh, very important issue. I personally find this type of alleged treatment uh, abhorrent. And well, alleged in the eyes of those who actually perpetrate this misconduct, it, this isn't treatment. And our Ontario Human Rights Code uh, is very specific on issues such as this. So this, I welcome the private member bill, members bill, private members bill from the member opposite, and I look forward to working with her. I know it's going to be debated this afternoon. And I want to emphasize, Mr. Speaker, that no current medical guidelines anywhere that I've found, certainly not in this province, support or endorse this kind of alleged treatment that would aim to change or convert someone away from being LGBT. Answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Health Minister recently denied that OHIP was paying for conversion therapy for LGBT kids. The fact is there are doctors, including very influential doctors, who are still trying to fix LGBTQ kids with abusive so-called conversion therapies. These doctors can and do bill OHIP for these abusive counselling sessions. Just last week, as a result of my bill and the hard work of LGBTQ activists, CAMH has launched a complete review of their treatment of trans youth, treatment the minister has denied is even happening. Again, to the Premier, do you agree that such conversion therapy Order. for LGBTQ students and children should be banned in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I take great offence to the accusation that I have somehow, at any point in time, said that this treatment isn't occurring or doesn't exist. It, it, I Order. challenge you to find that public record, but Mr. Speaker, excuse me. Stop the clock, please. Um, we best do our debating through the chair, and that way we don't uh, change the debate tenure. So I would ask the minister to address me and keep the heckling to a minimum. So the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, does know that there is no billing code in the schedule of benefits for OHIP for conversion therapy or anything like it. Uh, I have asked the call. I will be asking the colleges as well, the relevant ones, because there are a number that potentially could be involved in uh, addressing this important situation to explore amending the regulations to ban this practice uh, as it should be banned. I believe if a particular incident were to be brought forward, and I would encourage anyone who is aware of such alleged treatments taking place anywhere in this province, that they should go forward to the appropriate regulatory body. I'm asking them to uh, review Answer. the regulations, uh, and certainly it is nothing. This, this is not something this government would ever support or endorse. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. Order. 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 Do I have to go to members? New question, please. Minister, member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, the investments our government has made to take a dirty and unreliable electricity system and make it clean and reliable has been putting cost pressures on Ontario families. For many low-income Ontarians, paying their monthly electricity bill is a challenge, and I have heard this from some constituents in my riding of Kitchener Centre. In comparison to other residential users in the province, low-income Ontarians spend a disproportionately higher percentage of their income on paying the monthly power bill. While we recognize that our government is working hard to keep electricity affordable for all Ontarians, could the minister please tell this House what our government is doing to help low-income households with their Stork, electricity Stork bills? Mine. Thank you. <laughs> minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, firstly, thank you to the member from Kitchener Centre for the question. And, uh, 
the issue of helping low-income Ontarians with the cost of the electricity bill is one that we have been working hard to alleviate for some time now. While there are already emergency assistance programs and conservation programs in place to reduce electricity costs for Ontarians, we recognize the need to establish an ongoing support program for those most in need. So just this morning, with members of the Low Income Energy Network, I announced that our government is taking action to make electricity more affordable for Ontarians through the proposed implementation of the Ontario Electricity Support Program. The program would provide ongoing assistance directly on the bills of eligible low-income electricity yes, consumers starting January 1, 2016. And I want to thank the members for the network for their collaboration with the Ontario Energy Board. Thank you, Minister, for informing us about this proposed rollout of the Ontario Electricity Support Program. Uh, it is encouraging to hear that this program would provide targeted help to those who need it the most and making sure that all Ontarians, especially low-income Ontarians, have continued access to clean and reliable electricity. The proposed creation of this Ontario Electricity Support Program would also support the government's commitment to reducing poverty in Ontario, given that energy costs are a significant part of housing costs for many households. As the rollout of this program coincides with the end of the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, could the minister give us some more details on how the Ontario Electricity Support Program is going to help low-income Ontarians, Question. how much financial assistance it will provide, and if there are other programs that they might qualify Thank you. for? Minister. Good question. Mr. Good question. Mr. Speaker, the program would provide targeted support. It would be based on a sliding scale that provides support based on a household's income and size. The OESP would work together with the Ontario government's decision to remove the debt retirement charge from all residential consumers' bills at the end of this year. For example, for a family of four with an annual income of less than $28,000, the combined savings from the OESP and the removal of the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker, will be about $525 annually. There are also existing programs available to help Ontarians with their electricity costs. These include the Low Income Energy Assistance Program, the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, the Northern Ontario yes, Energy Credit, and the Save on Energy Home Assistance Program. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is committed to assisting those people most in need. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, over the past several months, Orange Air Ambulance has refused calls to land at helipads at night in Perry Sound District. In August 2014, a 16-year-old girl was seriously injured in an ATV accident, just seven minutes from the Ardbeg helipad. Despite solar lights having been installed, fine flying weather, and a letter from Orange saying night restrictions had been lifted, Orange refused to land. They instead landed at Perry Sound Hospital, a 45-minute land ambulance drive one way. Minister, local first responders have no certainty if an orange helicopter will land when needed. So as minister, what can you do to provide some certainty as to the availability of air ambulance services in Perry Sound District and across the north? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member opposite bringing this uh, issue uh, to our attention. It is an issue that I'm aware of. I've asked uh, my officials to uh, look into the particular circumstances surrounding this. I also know that the member opposite, and he has uh, uh, commented somewhat on the, the sorts of parameters that we need to look at, uh, but there are many conditions that determine whether or not a, uh, an air ambulance, an orange helicopter or fixed-wing uh, aircraft can or cannot land at a particular locality. They obviously uh, make every effort uh, 
subject to the safety of the individuals that are piloting or on that craft itself. They make every effort to ensure that they can provide the highest quality of care uh, on an urgent basis to those that need it. But again, Mr. Speaker, I will. Uh, I already am. I have asked my uh, officials to uh, to further with Orange to uh, look at the details of this in Answer. terms of how we might, uh, going on a go forward basis, provide a higher level of certainty. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and I'm glad you recognize there is a problem, and you understand that in an emergency, time is of the essence. Local first responders and municipal officials have tried to get answers from Orange and have been in contact with your office. I've spoken with the Mayor of Whitestone, Chris Armstrong, and with the Fire Chief, Bob Whitman. They feel like they're getting the runaround from Orange. They say that air ambulance is a vital link, that the current situation is not an acceptable situation. And it's not just Ardbeg. Orange won't land at night at South River or Brit helipads and many across the north as well. So, Minister, when can you tell the people of Perry Sound District, when can the people of Perry Sound District expect to get certainty on whether Orange will land at their helipads before a tragedy happens? Thank you, Minister. Well, you know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I've uh uh, committed to following up on this as I already am, in fact, uh, through uh, our officials and with Orange. And I, I have no doubt that the member opposite appreciates as well that it's not just the safety and well being for the uh, patient or the potential patient, but it's also the safety and well being of the pilots, the paramedics, those that uh, are on these craft uh, doing this important service uh, every single day. So uh, we make every effort, and I know Orange does as well, to provide the highest quality of service. Uh, in fact, 90% of patients transports uh, from emergency scenes were actually confirmed within 10 minutes, Mr. Speaker, and, and so they, uh, they do remarkable work every day around this province. There are specific uh, circumstances that may lead to a positive or a negative decision in terms of their ability to land at a specific location. And as you mentioned to the member opposite, I'm looking into this specific case. Thank you. New question, member from Toronto, Dan. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Last year, an ECOS poll revealed that 75 per cent of Ontarians support a ban on hydraulic fracturing, otherwise known as fracking. Yesterday, I tabled a bill that would do just that. The bill follows the lead of other jurisdictions like New York, Quebec, Nova Scotia. Uh, the Minister of the Environment expressed an interest in meeting with me about the bill, but then the Minister of Natural Resources said that this bill was not on, the government wouldn't support it. Why was the Minister of the Environment left out of the loop when this government decided not to support a ban on fracking? I thank the member for the question, and I appreciate his private member's bill. I think it's an issue uh, with serious potential consequences, and it has merit, and I thank him for putting it forward. Uh, you asked, I understand, as you've just said, the, the Minister of the Environment, for a meeting on this. You didn't ask the minister responsible for the legislation for a meeting on this. Had you done that, I would have been more than happy to accommodate the request. Speaker, as I've said in the legislature, I think before Christmas, maybe back at the beginning of December, I thought I was pretty clear. There was a question from the member from uh, Windsor-Tecumseh on the issue about fracking back in December or earlier than that. I'm sure you've had opportunity to talk to him, and I think at that point I was pretty clear in terms of our position on it, and that is that it would have required legislative change before we would have gone forward with anything in this particular regard. So that's on the record. I'm surprised you didn't have an opportunity to check Answer. with the minister responsible for the legislation, but still happy to do that and happy and thankful that the member has brought forward an issue that I think is, is a very serious and one we need to Thank consider. You. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. While no fracking is taking place at the moment in Ontario, several energy firms have previously bought land rights in southwestern Ontario and have expressed interest in shale gas fracking. In 2012, the Environmental Commissioner warned that fracking was essentially unregulated in Ontario and without rules, Ontario's water supply would be at grave risk. And despite the lack of environmental regulations, the government has rushed ahead to declare that a ban is unnecessary. No debate. It makes no sense for the government to oppose a ban simply on the grounds that fracking is not happening at the moment. After all, coal-fired electricity plants are not in operation at the moment, but that has not stopped the government from tabling a bill to ban them. Will the government take the issue of fracking seriously and formally ban the practice? 
Minister. Speaker, I thank the member for the question, and, and I guess his private member's bill, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't read it, but the Legislative Assembly will determine how his particular bill is uh, dealt with in, in due course. Speaker, as he's mentioned in his, his uh, opening comments, fracking is not occurring anywhere in the province of Ontario right now, and it does, should it be requested, require a license from my particular ministry under the Oil, Gas and Salt Resources Act. Listen. I want to stress that protecting our environment and water is a, pro a top priority for our government. I thought I spoke pretty clearly to this issue many months ago, Speaker. I welcome the legislation. I look forward to the debate. We'll see how the Legislative Assembly deals with the members, particular private member's bill. No fracking occurring now. No applications in front of me for a decision at this time. Yes, legislative change would be required before we would consider moving forward with fracking in the province of Ontario. The Minister of Children and Youth Services on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. After question period in Room 213, the White Ribbon Campaign is holding a pre-launch photo shoot for its upcoming public education campaign, and it's called I'm a Male Model. So that seeks to recognize men from all walks of life who are positive role models for men and boys. So I want to welcome all MPPs to join, and especially our male MPPs. You are fantastic role models, and I'd love to have your participation in this campaign. So come by and have your photo taken in one of the t-shirts called uh, I'm a Male Model, and it'll go on the campaign website. And uh, you'll be That's, um that's actually not a point of order, but I'm assuming that every single man in this room would like to be a male model, so we'll <laughs> remind everybody about the room. Point of order from the, uh, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Please join me in welcoming the Jensen Farmer team. Uh, joining them today is Vice President Julia Brown, uh, Catherine Law and Charlene uh, Lee, and other members of the Government Affairs and Market Access team at Jansen, which is located in the beautiful riding of Don Valley East. Welcome. Thank you. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, point of order, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome to the Legislature, uh, on behalf of Paige Aidan Campbell from the Great Riding of Simcoe Gray, his grandmother, mother, Sharon Inkster, uh, grandfather, Doug Inkster, and her, his great uncle, Phil Sled. And I'll just note that uh, Mr. Sled was the mayor of Severn Township for many, many, many years. Well, we always love welcoming our guests to the Legislature. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.